Great. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Sara Felipe Fernandez. I'm the head of the Technology and Innovation Unit here at the IEA. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the 2024 edition of the IEA's Global Electric Vehicle Outlook, where some of the principal authors that you see on screen will be unpacking the key findings of our analysis this year. The report was released earlier this week by our Executive Director, uh, Dr. Fatih Mirol, and our Chief Energy Technology Officer, Dr. Timo Good, with a live stream press conference that was attended by more than 20,000 people. And the author has already received quite great uh, press coverage with articles from Financial Times, CNN, Bloomberg, Reuters, or The Guardian, among others, which has been really rewarding for the team. We just carried out yesterday as well um, the first technical webinar, and this is the second one in that series. So uh, very much uh, grateful and um, uh, happy about the feedback that uh, the team is, is receiving from this analysis. Just looking at the current landscape, uh, the rise of electric cars in recent years has been extraordinary, and it has, of course, huge implications for the auto industry, but also for the energy sector. And something that I'm sure many of you have noticed in recent months is all the uh, bad news about electric cars. When one reads uh, some of the reports in the media, uh, one could find uh, himself uh, thinking that uh, the growth of electric cars have come to a screeching halt. Well, at the International Energy Agency, what we do is to focus on data. And when we look at that data, what we see is that, in fact, is that uh, the growth in electric car sales worldwide has remained robust. Over the first quarter of this year, global electric car sales were around one quarter higher than the sales in the first quarter of 2023, which uh, we think is a very healthy growth, despite some of the observed challenges that have been discussed. Now, the Global uh, EV Outlook uh, edition this year is again accompanied by two online tools as well, the Data and Policy Explorers that are also available fully on our website beyond the actual report, and they provide further information on this market and policy trends as well as projections that my colleagues will be unpacking uh, today. Now, if we just move quickly to the next slide, uh, we wanted, of course, to highlight that um, this year we've produced the Global EV Outlook uh, once again with the support of the Electrical Vehicle Initiative, a multi-governmental policy forum established in 2010 and then the Clean Energy Ministerial as part of our role as coordinator of this initiative. The EVI is dedicated to accelerating the adoption of electric vehicles worldwide, striving to better understand the policy challenges related to electric mobility, to help governments address them, and to serve as a platform for knowledge sharing among other uh, governmental uh, and uh, industry policymakers. The EBI has uh, also facilitated exchanges between government policymakers and a variety of other partners, as I mentioned, industry, for example, technology developers, OEMs, etc., on topics uh, important for the transition to electric mobility, such as charging infrastructure, grid integration, as well as EV battery supply chains. Last year's edition uh, of the Global EV Outlook marked the 10th anniversary of this project, which has been produced every year since then. And the Outlook uh, is dedicated to uh, tracking and monitoring the progress of electric mobility worldwide and to informing policymakers on how to best accelerate electrification of the road transport. So we just wanted to uh, express a special thank you from the whole team uh, to the EBI members that are joining us today for their support throughout this uh, process as well as to all the peer reviewers that have generously shared their suggestions and feedbacks uh, throughout the development of the project as well. And just before delving into the analysis, let me uh, mention that uh, there will be a Q&A session after the presentation uh, by my colleagues. Please pose your questions in the Q&A function or the chat uh, on Zoom uh, throughout the presentation already, so we could make sure we can address as many questions as possible afterwards. And uh, just a note as well to uh, highlight that the slide deck uh, that will be presented today will be made available on our website, uh, on our website, sorry, together with a recording of the session um, after the webinar so that uh, you have all the materials available with yourself. Well, with that, uh, let me hand it over to my colleague, Elizabeth Connelly, who's gonna start unpacking uh, these interesting findings from our uh, work. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Araceli. So yeah, today we'll start by looking at how electric car sales have been going. So as, as mentioned, you know, there's been a lot of talk about an EV slowdown. And so with this publication, you know, we want to show what the data is telling us. Um, and I think 
you know, an interesting point to make before looking at that is that for the past several years, we've kind of started each year with some concern about how EV sales growth is going to go. And so thinking back to 2021, this was right after the pandemic. And we were wondering, you know, what happens if these kind of COVID stimulus subsidies are phased out? Uh, but what we saw is that these subsidies continued and EV car sales continued growing strongly, reaching 6.6 .6 million in 2021. In 2022, there were uncertainties focused on supply chain disruptions, uh, geopolitical uncertainty, as well as some high commodity and energy costs. But again, electric sales grew and reached 10 million that year. As we went into 2023, there was speculation about what would happen given that at the end of 2022, China phased out its purchase subsidy. Um, and would that be reflected in, in the 2023 sales? But what we saw is that you know, sales continued to grow uh, globally reaching 14 million, uh, which was 35% higher than the year before. And indeed China represented about 60% of these sales. So very strong there. But so here we are at the beginning of, uh, 2024, and we're again, you know, concerned about electric car sales. Um, but what we've seen is that sales have continued to grow uh, by 25% relative to the same period last year, uh, which is a healthy growth, we think. Of course, there are some valid concerns that we've seen. So in China, for example, in February, we did see that sales fell year on year by 10%, but this is almost fully explained by the Chinese New Year. Uh, bringing down sales and for the full quarter, Chinese sales actually increased 35% over the previous year. In the US, we've seen uh, over the first quarter, the sales share of battery electric cars has actually gone down. Uh, but for the most part, this has been compensated by increasing sales of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And then in Europe in March, we did see electric car sales drop in some key markets like Germany and Italy. Um, but part of this is also due to sluggish car markets. Um, and overall, in the quarter, European sales were up around 8%. And so, as I said, you know, globally, we saw a 25% increase in the first quarter. This is reaching around 3 million EVs sold, which is equivalent to the total sales we saw in the full year of 2020. And so, given these trends, looking forward, to, forward for the rest of this year, we expect it to be another strong year, and we expect a uh, electric car sales to reach around 17 million, which would represent about, would be over one in five cars sold being electric up from 18% last year. In particular, we think Chinese growth will be strong and around 45% of all cars sold there could be electric this year. In Europe, about one in four cars sold we expect and in the US around 11%. And so this uh, boost in electric car sales is really changing the way the car industry looks. Um, so when we look at conventional cars, we see that last year only around 10% were sold by Chinese automakers, while the rest uh, comes mostly from Europe and Japan as big players, but also from the US and Korea. But the electric car industry looks very different. So here of the 14 million electric cars sold globally, about 60% came from, or over half, I guess I should say, um, came from Chinese automakers. And I think, you know, th this makes sense for several reasons. Uh, for one, Chinese, um, China sold around 60% of global electric cars last year, and uh, Chinese OEMs kind of dominate that market at over 80% of Chinese car sales, electric car sales. So, you know, it makes sense, but I think, um, you know, we're seeing Chinese OEMs also becoming more popular in other countries. And of course, you know, all of the electric car manufacturers are kind of seeking to expand their reach and looking to non-domestic auto uh, markets, including in emerging and developing economies. So in 2023, we saw electric car sales increase significantly in some of these emerging markets. In India, for example, um, car sales, electric car sales were up 70% year on year. Um, and this reached about a 2% uh, sales share. But when you look at kind of total volumes, that's quite significant given the size of India's car market. We also saw strong growth in Vietnam and Thailand. And Thailand reached a 10% sales share, which is comparable to what we saw in the US. But looking at kind of um, where these cars are, are coming from, um, we see kind of two different stories appearing. 
So the first, uh, what we see in India and Vietnam, for example, is that domestic car makers are really leading car sales in these markets. In India, we have um, Tata and Mahindra that constitute a majority, I think about 80% of sales last year. In Vietnam, almost all of the sales are coming from their domestic auto producer, VinFast. While on the other hand, in Thailand and Indonesia, we're seeing uh, Chinese car makers really boosting electric car sales in these markets, um, mostly due to some of the more uh, affordable car cars entering these markets. Uh, so we're, we're watching these trends closely and the impact it will have on emerging economies. Uh, but for that, I'll, I'll leave it here and I hand it over to Hilda to talk about second-hand car markets. Thank you, Elizabeth. So globally, many people are more likely to buy a second-hand car rather than a new one. For example, in the EU and in the US, between 80 and 90% of low and middle income earners buy their car second-hand rather than new. These markets therefore play an important role in furthering the adoption of electric cars. If we look at China, second-hand car sales increased by over 40% in 2023, representing 4% of all used car sales. Of all markets, China has the most advanced second-hand electric market and the 800,000 vehicles uh, represent close to 10% of all electric car sales in the country in 2023. Uh, these cars are very affordable as the average cost uh, was around 11,000 US dollars, which is less than half of the sales weighted average cost of new electric cars. Looking at the European countries you analyze, these are six European countries. It's quite common there that cars are first leased by a, by a company and after two to four years, uh, these cars are resold. While well, UCVs have a lower resale value than conventional car in these markets, this gap has been shrinking as the second-hand market has matured. In the United States, sales have also been growing steadily due to, the federal, due to a federal tax rebate of 4,000 US dollars on second-hand car sales less than 25,000 US dollars. Uh, the resale value in this market has therefore decreased in the last year. Uh, to put all of these uh, volumes in perspective, uh, the 1.5 million used electric cars sold last year in these three markets are roughly the same as the total new electric cars sold in the US. As these domestic secondhand markets are mature, we expect the export of used electric vehicles internationally to see an increase as well. And for here, we'll talk a bit about the the use the vehicle flows between countries. Uh, as we know, uh, many emerging economies have been importing used uh, internal combustion vehicles for decades. And traditionally, these biggest exports have been Europe, Japan, the United States, and Korea, which makes sense given that these were the major conventional car makers, uh, where these, uh, where the major conventional car makers are located. Uh, the main destinations for these used vehicles are Africa, Asia, and Central and South America. The United Nations Environmental Program estimates that Africa alone imports 40% of all used vehicles worldwide. Um, for uh, electric uh, use uh, vehicle trades, we, we expect that these trade flows will look very different uh, as uh, the conventional ones. Most notably, China will play a much larger role in the used electric uh, car exports. <clears throat> uh, before 2019, exporting used vehicles was forbidden in China but this has then, since then been changed, with some cities now allowed to export. And already in 2020, 2022, we saw over 50,000 used electric vehicles that were exported from China, <clears throat> the main destination being the Middle East. For emerging economies to take advantage of the growing secondhand electric car markets, their governments must make a number of considerations. The first one is to build skills capacity needed to uh, service EVs, Notably, the, the battery swapping is an important uh, consideration to take as these cars that arrive in these important countries will have, are much older than, uh, than when they're bought and they might need to, to swap batteries. <clears throat> A second one is to create recycling facilities for these batteries and ensure adequate end of life strategies for these EV batteries. And lastly, important countries will need to support the rollout of charging infrastructure. Which brings me to the next section, which is on charging, which is another important aspect to enable mass EV adaptation. To, today, we estimate about 65% of charging in terms of electricity consumption takes place at home or at the workplace, place with nearly 10 times as many 
private charges as pub public ones. <clears throat> However, building the consumer confidence and comfort needed for mass adoption of EVs requires the development of adequate public charging infrastructure. In mature EV markets such as Norway, we expect to see uh, we expect to see the number of EVs per public charging point increase. Here it's indic indicative of higher utilizations of the infrastructure, um, and more charges have been built across. Uh, more charges have been built across more, more of the country, serving more vehicles. However, the same trends in less mature markets, such as the United Kingdom or United States, can indicate that public charging infrastructure rollout is not keeping pace with EV sales. And this may hinder further uptake. A greater, share of, a greater share of consumers that are yet to adopt EVs in these countries may not have access to private charging at home. Uh, and, uh, and so allowing the ratios to rise like that this too early in the transition will negatively impact consumers' experience. In countries with more dense urban populations such as China and Korea, the relative low access to private charging means the quick rollout of public charging is even more important. Keeping the ratio of vehicles to charging low during the transition, we see that China has been particularly successful in this respect, despite the huge growth of EV sales and stock. Uh, and of course, another important aspect to enable mass adoption of EV affordability is EV affordability. So, hand to me. Thank you, Hilda. And so I'll just pivot um, now to affordability, which is uh, really what is important to many consumers, how affordable is your electric car relative to a conventional equivalent? And before I delve into the specific price trends that we've seen, I'd just like to mention a couple of main factors that actually have a big influence on affordability. We know that competition is a, is, is a huge component of EV affordability, but here there's two specific components that I would like to show. The first one is the size of your car. The bigger your car, the more expensive it's going to be. And so what we're seeing in the electric car market globally is a, a trend towards larger cars. And so on this chart, if you look at the orange little color here for SUVs, what you can see is that just five years ago, SUVs accounted for about 20% of global electric car sales, whereas last year in 2023, it was actually over 40%. This has important implications and uh, not only for price, but also for critical mineral demand, which we'll come back later. However, it's important also to note that this is not only for electric cars. This is actually a trend that we see in conventional car markets, a preference towards larger cars. The second component that has an influence on affordability is the choice of your battery, because different batteries have different prices. And what we've seen in the last few years is an increasing use of LFP batteries, lithium iron phosphate, and these are actually cheaper to manufacture than other lithium iron, uh, lithium iron uh, chemistries. And when five years ago, it was basically a, a very minor part of the market. Last year, LFP batteries accounted for 40% of global electric car sales. China is the primary adopter of such chemistry. And in China, 60% of the sales were actually using LFP batteries. So with this in mind, I'll uh, look at the price trends that we've seen between 2018 and 2022 in different car markets. Here, what you see on the screen is in full line, the vehicle price and in dotted lines, the battery price. These graphs are of course in the report, so I can't go into each of these categories here, but I'll just illustrate a few examples. If you look at the right-hand side here, what you can see in the United States is that the price of electric SUVs has been decreasing faster than the price of the battery over time. Of course, we're seeing that in different vehicles, the, the size of the battery is increasing. So its price is also increasing, but in relative terms, the price of the vehicle has been decreasing faster. And this is primarily driven by competition. With increasing competition, we see prices going down. Now, if we look at China, it's even more interesting when you look at electric SUVs, still on the right-hand side. Why? Because you see that the battery price has been increasing. And again, this is because the size of the battery is actually increasing. Remember, I just said that China uses a lot of LFP. So in fact, the battery price is decreasing. But when you account for the size increasing, the overall battery price of SUVs, uh, of the battery in SUVs is increasing. And yet, the price of the vehicle itself has been decreasing, which again, 
shows the very intense competition that's going on in the market. And this is actually driving um, affordability. And now if we look at Europe, we see different trends um, and it's a little bit similar to the, to the United States, but I'll, I'll here bring your attention to the middle segment of medium cars. This is particularly interesting because we can see that as consumers look for longer ranges in the medium sized car segment, the battery size is increasing. So the battery price is also increasing. And yet the price of the vehicle is actually increasing, but not as quickly. And so this again is a reflection of competition where car makers are, are decreasing their margins so that they can stay affordable and competitive. Now, this is only really looking at electric cars and not comparing them to their conventional equivalents. So in this slide, we're going to show the electric premium, which is how much more expensive is an electric car relative to a conventional one over time. So if we start with the United States, what you can see here on the right-hand side, what I, I just illustrated before with this intensifying competition is a considerable drop in the electric premium of SUVs, which means that five years ago, electric SUVs were prohibitively expensive relative to conventional SUVs, and they are getting more affordable in relative terms. As you can see though, the electric premium remains very high, above 50% in most cases. And just to clarify, all of this is adjusted for inflation, but before subsidies as well. Now, if we look at China, and this is a, perhaps the most interesting trend that we've seen is that small cars, for example, have now definitely passed the break-even point. In 2022, they were 40% cheaper than conventional equivalents on average. And when we look at the overall fleet of cars, when we updated these numbers to 2023, we estimate that on average, 60% of the electric cars sold in China were actually cheaper than their conventional equivalent. And this is really a level of affordability that we haven't seen um, anywhere else. And if we move to Europe, vehicles tend to be uh, already cheaper than in the US, however, more expensive than in China. And we, uh, we do see some improvement in the electric premium, but not so significant. Um, for example, if we look at Germany and, uh, and, and the specific uh, medium-sized segment, we estimate that 40% of these were cheaper than the, electric, the conventional equivalent. But when you look at all cars uh, sold in, in Germany, only 25% of the electric cars sold were cheaper than their conventional equivalent. So there remains some, some work to be done here. And our expectation is that looking forward, with really intensifying competition, we're going to see further price declines um, in the future. So this was about cars, but if we just um, come back to something we mentioned earlier about emerging markets, it's important to remember that in emerging markets, most people don't own a personal vehicle in the first place. And when they do, they typically don't own a car, but they own a, a motorcycle, a two or three wheeler. So in this slide, we're going to show the price of two and three wheelers, two wheelers specifically here in China and in India. So when we look here in, in China, we compare a motorcycle, electric and conventional. What we see in this slide is that even if on average, the retail price in dark blue of an electric motorcycle is 20% more expensive than the conventional equivalent, when you look at the total cost of ownership, so once you account for fuel, maintenance, financing, et cetera, it's actually 20% cheaper after five years of ownership. And this is very important when you consider adoption because the retail price itself doesn't tell the whole story. Over five years, actually your electric motorcycle is cheaper. When we look at the case in India, we see a similar story. Um, we look at two wheelers in India and what we see is that over five years of ownership, despite again, this dark blue being more expensive, overall, what we see is that it's 20% cheaper than the conventional equivalent. And when we add to that the incentives, the purchase incentives, they were in FAME 2 uh, until a month ago. It's a, a subsidy program in India that has been replaced by a transitionary program to support two-wheelers. When we add these subsidies, the total cost of ownership over five years is actually 40% cheaper than the conventional equivalent. So this is extremely important, not only for emerging markets, but all countries to realize that the retail price is only part of the picture and that consumers also look a little bit more into the future. And as you can see here, the fuel costs, the maintenance costs, they enable you to decrease the total cost of ownership. 
and this improves the affordability of your electric vehicles. And with that, um, we'll switch to the Outlook section. Thanks, JB. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I must say that our outlook to 2030 and 2035 remains very positive, mainly on the basis of underlying market trends and supportive policy and industry actions. Uh, and the EV transition will have implications for the car industry as well as for energy markets. Today, electric car sales are high, but it takes time, of course, until electric cars become a noticeable part of the fleet of vehicles we see on the roads. Today, around 8% of all the cars on the road in China are electric. In Europe, this share is 4%, and in the United States, it's 2%. But as a result of increasing sales, we project that even under current policy settings, more than 30% of the cards on the road in China could be electric by 2030. In the EU, the share of electric cards on the road could be nearly 20%, and the US, it could be just above 15%. And the more electric cars on the road, the greater impact there will be on oil demand. In 2030, under current policy settings, over 4 million barrels per day of oil is displaced just from electric cars. Another 1 million barrels per day comes from electric vans and trucks, and nearly another 1 million from electric buses and two and three wheelers. To put this in context, uh, this number around 6 million barrels per day is more than the total oil consumption for road transport in China in 2023. So as you can see, the electrification of road modes outside of cars will be important for meeting climate targets. And in fact, when looking at stock shares, two and three wheelers are currently the most electrified road transport segment. And we expect that to remain so. Given India's financial support for electric two, three wheelers and their fame schemes and the competitive total cost of ownership that we see, we expect the stock of electric two, three wheelers in India to expand rapidly. Looking at buses, we also see this segment being more electrified than cars in 2023 in terms of the share of on-road fleet. This is thanks to sustained electric bus sales in China, where 50% of large bus sales have been electric since 2016. To 2030, we expect electric buses to become more prevalent outside of China. In particular, there are funding programs in India and many Latin American countries that will expand the fleet of electric city buses in these regions. And in the US and the EU, recent heavy duty emission standards will work to increase electric bus and truck sales. In fact, electric truck sales are expected to reach around 20 to 30% in the three major markets, China, EU, US, and EU by 2030, bringing the global stock share to about 3%. And while that's certainly lower than what we see for other segments, I think it shows impressive growth, reaching a similar stock share as to what we have for cars today. Uh, and of course, all these electric vehicles will mean growing demand for electricity. So now I'll hand it over to my colleague Javier to discuss uh, the analysis we did on um, looking particularly at the impact of heavy duty vehicle charging on grids. Thank you very much, Ethan. In the case of charging of electric heavy duty trucks, it is really key to assess the impacts it may bring to the power grid, as power demand and driving patterns may vary significantly with those of electric vehicles. To analyze how different charging approaches would impact the grid, we use our publicly available EV charging and grid integration tool to develop charging profiles for four different cases. What I'll show today is the daily power demand for electric trucks in the US linked to these four cases we developed in 2035 in our announced purchase scenario. This demand sits on top of the power demand of all other end uses, including charging of lighter EVs and the industry. So here in our first case, trucks charge exclusively at the depot overnight. You'll notice power demand is lowest in the early morning. In case two, truck drivers have a balanced preference between overnight depot charging and Android charging uh, for about, uh, sorry, it have a balanced preference between overnight depot charging and charging at the loading dock around noon. Here, nighttime demand is lower than in the first case, while daytime demand increases. Similarly, in case three, drivers have a balanced preference between overnight depot charging and Android charging for about 45 minutes in the afternoon, with a charger capacity of up to 350 kilowatts. This capacity is what would be required for heavy duty vehicle charging along highways in the EU based on the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation. And here, the last case is practically the same, but with Android charging capacity of up to one megawatt, a binary tool that is already being pursued by several industry players. While overnight, slower charging is often considered the easiest for grids to handle, our analysis shows that there's also benefits of daytime charging. 
Using approaches that involve daytime charging can support solar PV integration and potentially lower charging costs for consumers, as wholesale prices for electricity tend to be lower during the day in systems with high solar penetration. In our numbers, up to about half of the daily charging needs of electric trucks can be met during daylight hours in our charging cases that include daytime charging. Now, however, uh, faster charging during the day, especially at megawatt scale, can raise concerns for power system operators who have to balance power supply and demand. Our analysis shows that based on our simulated charging approaches, electric truck charging would not be a significant driver for the early evening peak in either China, the EU, and the US in 2035 in the announced pledge scenario, despite electric truck stock shares switching around 20% in these figures. We look particularly at the evening peak because 5 to 8 p.m. is normally the most challenging period of today for system operators in systems with high solar penetration, because as end user power demand increases, solar generation uh, falls rapidly. This makes it difficult to keep a precise balance between demand and supply, which is really key for system security. In our analysis, heavy duty truck charging would increase peak demand by less than 1% on average during this period of the day for these regions, as a large share of these charging needs is met earlier in the day when the solar PV generation is highest. While we do recognize that fast charging of heavy duty trucks can bring benefits to the power systems, challenges such as overloading in local grids need to be managed to ensure a secure supply of electricity. As we described in our report, we also simulated the impacts of these cases on a local grid with the help from researchers from Aachen University. And what we found is that mostly at quite high EV stock shares of at least 50%, megawatt scale charging increases average power line utilization rates by more than five percentage points, implying a higher need for grid expansion and upgrades than slower charging approaches. This means that to manage these local challenges, a combination of anticipatory grid planning and other measures such as, for example, smart charging and stationary batteries may be needed. And with that, I'll turn it over to Theo to discuss the outlook for batteries. Thank you very much. So going to the core technology behind EVs, so batteries, demand in 2023 grew significantly 45% year on year, driven by higher EV and stationary storage sales. And to give a sense <clears throat> of the scale that we reached in 2023, the average monthly demand was about the same as the entire 2017. And electric cars accounted for the lion's share of this with 80%, in 2023, while battery storage for 10% and the other demand sources like two free wheelers, buses, and trucks for two free percent each. In the stated policy scenario, battery demand in 2030 is set to expand over four and a half times compared to 2023, with an average monthly battery demand close to the demand of the entire of 2021. In 2030, electric cars still account for the largest share of demand, which is about 75%, but demand for electric truck in particular grows rapidly and reach 8% in the same year, while the second source of demand remains stationary storage with about 10%. Today, China, Europe, and the United States are the main driver of battery demand and account for over 90% of it, with China alone accounting for more than half of the demand, of global demand in 2023. However, battery demand in the rest of the world grew rapidly, and in 2030, in the stated policy scenario, we reached 15% of global demand, while in the if all pledges are fulfilled, we reached 20% in 2030, that is the double compared to today. And when we move from demand to production, we see production follow demand with a growth of 45% from 2022 to 2023. But today, manufacturing capacity, if used fully, so here we assume an utilization factor of 85%, will produce 2.5 times more batteries compared to what we produce in 2023, with over 85% of this extra production capacity located in China. And if all committed plants by 2030 will be built fully, the maximum battery production will be sufficient to cover the domestic demand of both China and European Union and almost sufficient for the United States. While if all announced manufacturing, uh, announced plants so both committed and preliminary could be constructed, then the maximum production will be able to easily fulfill the demand of both China, United States, of China, United States and Europe in, uh, in 2030 in the announced pledge scenario. However, in the rest of the world, the maximum production could serve only half of the domestic demand in APS in 2030, 
And that means there are significant opportunities for regions like India and South, uh, South America countries to build new manufacturing capacity or to establish good trade relationships with, um, with other uh, regions that have enough manufacturing capacity for exporting batteries or EVs. On a global level, current and committed battery manufacturing capacity will be sufficient to cover the APS demand in 2030 and over 90% of the NZD demand in the same year, indicating the battery producers stand ready to fulfill our collective climate ambitions. As underlined, however, there are significant regional differences, and the main challenge for Chinese producers in particular will be to find enough export markets to use significant share of their manufacturing capacity, while the main challenge for European and American producers will be to scale up and demonstrate to be competitive on, on battery products. And with this, I hand over uh, to Ethan for speaking about our life cycle analysis in the report. Um, so as part of this year's publication, we took a closer look at life cycle analysis at the level of the individual vehicle. Using 2023 global average values, we see that though producing the car and the battery are energy and material intensive processes, the driving cycle dominates the life cycle emissions for all powertrains. For ICE vehicles, over 90% of the emissions come from fuel production and combustion, while for battery battery electric vehicles, around 60% of emissions come from charging the battery. The much greater efficiency of an electric powertrain can therefore in general quickly pay back the additional manufacturing emissions associated with EVs. How quickly, of course, varies by region and depends on several factors, uh, particularly the annual driving distance and electricity grid emissions intensity. Here, in the case of plug-in hybrids and global average emissions, the payback occurs within a year of operation relative to internal combustion engines, and early in the third year compared to hybrids. Separating out the impact of grid decarbonization over time, the vehicle's lifetime shows that these points are quickly reached even without the positive effect of planned additional renewable electricity. For battery electric vehicles, those break-even or crossover points occur in the middle of the second year, and as with plug-in hybrids early in the third year. Therefore, the savings accumulate, leading to much lower life cycle emissions for EVs purchased today compared to ICEs. Boosted further when we consider electricity grid emissions improvements over time. The key takeaway here is that EVs offer emissions benefits today, and these benefits grow over time. In the step scenario, over a 15-year lifetime, a BEV is expected to produce half the life cycle emissions of an ICE while a PHEV, plug-in hybrid vehicle, reduces emissions by around 30%. As mentioned, there are, of course, regional differences. However, each of the regions examined in the analysis resulted in the same hierarchy. Uh, and we also uh, want to say that we will be releasing a life cycle analysis tool where you can uh, integrate the results and assumptions further for yourself. And with that, I'll put it back to Teo for some battery rest. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, as a function of our SCA analysis, we also took a deep dive into emissions for EV batteries, in particular looking how emission intensity differ between the main battery chemistries. And then we looked at LFP on one side and I nickel chemistry represented by NNC811 on the other. And you can see that LFP has significantly lower emissions on a kilowatt hour basis, about a third less. And the source of emission difference. So high nickel batteries tend to require more energy intensive mineral processes than LFP, while the battery manufacturing step is more energy intensive for LFP compared to NNC due to its lower energy density. And the four strategies to reduce the emission footprint of batteries will thus differ based on the battery chemistry. And for both technologies, we do see in the future an important role of innovation and improvements that lead to a decrease in emission of about 30%, 30-35%. And this comes from an assumed energy intensity increase from 2023 to 2030 of 30%, and a cathode active material recycle content of 20%. And another factor that however can play an important role is the further electrification of the grid and the decarbonization of our grid, of course, with the entire battery supply chains that use only for about 20-25% electricity as, as energy source. And of course, also recycling can play an important role for uh, reducing emission of batteries, in particular for chemistry with high mineral intensities like NNC. But 
Battery recycling is not only important for emission reduction, it's also key to build a sustainable and circular battery supply chains and mitigate critical minerals demand in the next day. And if used fully, but a recycling capacity today can already cover 300 and a recycle of 300 gigawatt hour batteries per year. And this will grow almost fivefold from 2023 to 2030, if all announcements are completed in full. In 2030, China accounted for over 80% of global recycling capacity, while European and United States for less than 2%. However, we do see a significant diversification coming, and in 2030, the recycling landscape is set to diversify, with the Chinese share decreasing to 70%, so still very high, but lower than today, and Europe and United States reaching about 10% each. If all announced plans are built, however, in 2030, the world, the world will have about three times more capacity than the potential supply of end-of-life batteries. And that's because end-of-life batteries grow more in the next decade where production grows uh, for batteries grow better in this decade. And two thirds of the supply in 2030 for recycling plants will come from EV batteries and three quarters of it will come from battery manufacturing scraps. In the short term, this overcapacity will have important financial implications for recycling companies that are unable to secure stable source of end-of-life batteries, resulting in significant consolidation of the market. But this is not set in stone, and the output could still change depending on whatever announcements translate into final investment decisions or not. And let me add that this does not mean that nascent recycling business, in particular in Europe and the United States, do not require investment and public support, because they do. And they, because they are induced recycling business are just nascent and are emerging in those, in those regions. In addition, building in advance battery recycling plants and developing the regulation and battery tracking system to recover and recycle as many batteries as possible remain critically important to anticipate the rapid growth expected in the 2030. And that's a place in which regulation matters, as shown by the case of lead batteries in, that are mostly all recycled in regions with uh, good regulation on, on the topic, despite the lower residual value compared to lithium batteries. And with this, I hand over to Elizabeth for some final recommendation. Great, thanks so much. Yep, so we wanted to leave you with a few final recommendations, but obviously we've seen a lot of questions come in. So thank you very much for those. And we wanna have plenty of time to, to answer those. So I'll try to make this quick. Uh, and I have to admit, you know, uh, looking at our high level recommendations, these haven't really changed much over the past few years. Um, but what we've tried to do in this edition of the Global EV Outlook is analyze different pieces that can can inform policymakers on, on these recommendations. So I think for, as a first example, in terms of um, providing support for electric cars, you know, what we find is that it's important to understand both the price and cost uh, competitiveness of EVs on the market when compared to conventional vehicles. And so one thing we've seen in China, right, is that they were able to phase out their purchase subsidy um, without much disruption to the electric car sales in the country, given this kind of price competitiveness we see uh, between electric cars and conventional cars in the country. Uh, when we look at emerging markets and promoting EV sales there, um, obviously affordability is key, uh, not just for cars, but also for two and three wheelers, which are more prevalent means of transport in a lot of these countries. Um, and affordability also should take into consideration the upfront costs. And so some measures that can uh, support emerging markets, electric vehicle sales there um, would be low cost financing for EV purchases and also by allowing imports of used EVs into the country. Of course, charging infrastructure will be needed to help support and enable uh, adoption of EVs. Um, and then when we look to the heavy duty vehicle market, uh, we've seen already that emission standards are playing a role uh, or have been passed recently in the US and EU, and these are expected to help increase electric bus and truck sales. Um, other measures that can support heavy duty vehicle uh, sales are, are zero and low emission zones, uh, financial incentives for purchasing and uh, support for heavy duty vehicle charging. And so linking kind of this heavy duty vehicle charging as well as EV charging more generally, it's important that um, anticipatory measures are taken to build out and upgrade grids before they become a bottleneck to EV adoption. And this is given kind of the long lead times that you can take. Further, implementing smart charging will be important for reaping the benefits that um, 
that EVs can provide to the grid, such as increasing renewables integration and reducing sex, uh, system flexibility needs. We've seen progress on this in the UK, which recently announced regulations in 2022 to ensure uh, the smart functionality of chargers. And in China, we've seen calls for technical standards for vehicle grid integration. But beyond this, I should also mention there are complementary solutions to grid expansion that can be explored. Uh, for example, using stationary uh, batteries and battery swapping that can help mitigate local grid impacts. Finally, this EV transition will require building out new supply chains um, to which we've seen a lot of investment flowing already. Um, and while we've shown that EVs purchased today offer substantial emission savings compared to conventional vehicles, it remains important to think about sustainability in a broader sense and to limit critical mineral and other material inputs through innovation, battery and vehicle right sizing, and recycling. And finally, with respect to recycling, it's important to have a good understanding of where vehicles and batteries are going to reach their end of life to ensure that uh, facilities are set up where they're needed. And so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for, for submitting the questions. We're going to take a quick pause just to uh, organize ourselves, and we'll come back in a second for the Q&A. Thank you everyone for uh, staying online. So we've had a, a few Q and A's um, in the chat. And so I'll distribute these to colleagues here on the table. And just before we do so, please um, just remind yourselves that we have online the report fully available for free as well as a data explorer and a policy explorer. So if some of the numbers are confusing or you'd like to delve deeper into the, the details, please do feel free to go there. And if we cannot answer all the questions, you can also reach out to us via email after this. So. Um, we can dial uh, right in. There's, there's a question about the oil displacement forecast um, and specifically about the assumptions that we, that we have for mileage and for the distance traveled, uh, for example, in the US. Um, and maybe this is for you, Elizabeth. Would you like to talk about our oil forecast? Great, yep, thanks for the question. So uh, certainly we have uh, different assumptions from mileage or distance traveled for the different countries. This is based on the work we do um, updating our road database every year. Um, and certainly, you know, what we see between China and the US is that China has below average annual mileage while the US has above average. Um, and so of course, then US electric car sales can maybe have more of an impact on oil displacement than those we see in China. Um, what I'll say about our forecast, at first, firstly, I think we don't like to use that word, what we have is scenario projections. And so when we're looking at our stated policy scenario, this is based on what policies have been put into place. And in the US, that includes the recent um, US EPA regulation on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from light duty vehicles. And so, you know, this is expected to increase EV and zero emission vehicle sales. And so that's kind of why we've seen um, the outlook for the US increase. Thanks, Elizabeth. <clears throat> we have a couple of questions on affordability, secondhand markets, um, 
And so I think I'm, I'll start with you, maybe Hilda, on, on, on the secondhand markets, and then I'll take a couple of them on affordability. There's this question about the, the average age of, uh, of, of cars resold on markets. And I guess maybe there's differences between conventional cars, electric cars, and maybe there's questions about the assumptions that we make in, in our analysis. Yeah, so the, about the average age in the secondhand car markets, we don't have super detailed data as we do for sales, for example, of these markets, because it's quite hard to, uh, to track all these things. But in general, you could say that right now, electric cars are um, have a lower average age than conventional cars. And this is uh, very uh, logical because there are just uh, more newer electric vehicles in the world than there are for uh, conventional. And also uh, CADA, it's uh, the Second Hand Association for China. Uh, they say they, they see that um, the conventional cars, the average age is about five years old, while electric cars are three years old. So, and I expect to see the same for European markets and the US. Um, a couple of questions are coming on uh, affordability, looking at different markets. Different markets show different trends. We see something different in China than in Europe and the US. So there's a question on China. How, how can we explain that electric cars are so uh, cost competitive and cheap in China? And relatedly, what can we think about? Um, what can we look forward to in, in the US and Europe in, in the short term? Can we see actually more Chinese cars coming to these markets? So I, I think I'll take these quickly. Um, so in China, there's really a few points to mention here, but the, the primary driver of the cost going down, the price going down is really competition. And if you look at in the last two years, there's been considerable drops. A, a price war, as they call it, has been initiated a few years ago. Uh, and this is primarily between Tesla and BYD, but also just another uh, range of car makers there. So competition is driving this down. It's important though, to understand that Chinese car makers are able to operate on lower profit margins for several reasons. The first one is economies of scales that they've, they've been managing to build over time, thanks to support. But the other one is that vertical integration in China. So build, building closer supply chain between car makers and battery makers actually has helped them cut costs without you know, uh, going bankrupt, essentially. Last year, BYD's margins were about half of that of Tesla. And yet, uh, they are still you know, best selling in China. This being said, um, even if we see cheaper cars in, in China, last year the ministry uh, in China was concerned that many of these car makers are still unprofitable, so it's definitely a concern there as well. Nevertheless, our estimates are that 60% of the cars sold last year, electric cars, were cheaper than their ICE equivalent, so these decades of, of support have, have definitely been useful. When we move to the US and, and Europe, um, competition is still one of the main drivers, so as we see sales shares increasing, we can expect stronger competition and stronger, um, and stronger price declines. There's concerns in, in the Q&A as well about subsidies being phased out. Well, it's, it's, a, it's an essential point, of course, subsidy support, but it's not the only one. And so there's other policy instruments that are helping. Standards are definitely helping as well. Also, subsidies are not being phased out everywhere. In France, for example, those specific subsidies for lower uh, income households still in place for electric cars. In the report, we have numbers about the price buckets that we can see for future launches in, in the US, for example. We do see that these are not yet affordable to the mass market consumer, but competition is still driving these prices down. Um, with that, I think we can transition to another topic and there's, um, there's specifically one on batteries actually. So there's one on batteries and, and one on charging. So I'll hand it to Teo and, and Javier here. So Teo, there's a question about why people choose LFP? Uh, and, and I guess, you know, there's cheaper, but is that the one component? Yeah, thank you. So LFP has actually several advantages. It's cheaper and then price competitiveness is definitely one point, but it's not the only reasons why Chinese investors so heavily in LFP. Other advantages are, for instance, higher thermal stability, so higher intrinsic safety, but also lower demand for critical minerals like nickel and cobalt, even though it requires more lithium per kilowatt hour compared to NNC, NNC battery. So the reasons why there is such a momentum for LFP is a combination of all those factors. And however, there are also challenges on LFP, like the very concentrated supply chain. Today, basically, production and manufacturing capacity of LFP is practically all in China. And, and that can be a concern for, uh, for other regions. 
So that's also something that is important to plug. And all these different aspects and trade-offs are discussed in the report. So um, I really invite you to, to dig in uh, more into that. Thanks, Theo. Um, there, there's now two questions I'm charging, actually, one for Javier and, and another one for Elizabeth, I think. So, so Javier, you, you talked a lot about these different profiles for heavy duty trucks, right? And, uh, and how charging can actually be uh, an opportunity, but also a challenge, right? So there's a question about the, the possibility of aligning this charging with solar hours and, and the impact on the evening peak demand. Could you comment perhaps a little bit on, on, on these issues? Of course, thank you. So I will begin saying that our analysis is aimed at exploring what trade-offs exist between these charging approaches. So this means that, that this is not a forecast of the actual behavior of the whole fleet. And it also is not a prescription because probably in real life, what we'll see is that the charging will happen with a combination of all of these approaches, not just one of them, like just under charging or just overnight. It will be a combination to some degree of all of them probably. But that said, we did take inspiration from real life duty cycle of represent a heavy duty drugs fleet. For example, in the EU, today there's a mandatory regulation to have breaks of 45 minutes, which is what we reflect in our cases with which combine overnight depot charging and under charging. And similarly, uh, trucks in real life stop at loading docks to either load or unload goods, which is what we try to reflect in our case too. So even if some particular fleets uh, have stop times that are a bit earlier or later than our modeling, and we see is that our analysis shows that if there is some degree of fast uh, daytime charging, we will have the added benefit of matching that with higher solar PV output, which will be benefits to consumers in terms of uh, integration of renewables and also possibly of lower uh, prices while it Thanks, and, and on that topic, I'm just also flagging to the audience that yesterday the IA released a battery report which uh, goes into a great uh, length of details to understand how batteries can support greater integration of renewables. And I think we can expect looking forward that batteries enabling you know, more power stationary uh, storage can actually also help with better integration of charging in different locations, of course, uh, where that is cost competitive and, and technically feasible. Continuing on charging, and I think that's a question for, for you, Elizabeth. Um, there is a question about the average capacity utilization uh, that we that we see in public charging. And I think people are wondering whether that is the same in different markets or whether we see variation there. Sure, I mean, I think the first thing to note is we don't have good data on the utilization of public chargers. You know, a lot of times this is private companies operating these. And so this isn't made publicly available often. Um, I will say, you know, in our model, we do have regional variation and we have the utilization today around 10 to 15%. Um, and this is based on conversations that we've had with charge point operators. So I think to me, I, I find that value a bit low, but they're saying, you know, what they want for consumers is that EV drivers can arrive and charge and not face long lines. And so that's why in their planning, at least they want utilization to remain relatively low. And so this is what we've reflected in our modeling. But again, uh, yeah, if there's any data sources out there that can uh, be given to us, we'd be happy to accept them. And that's a good point, Elizabeth. I remember indeed that when drafting the report, we were seeing many different surveys made in different countries where we understand what you know what ratio of the population has access to private charging at home, and, and we see some variation. But also, I don't know how 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 confident we can be extrapolating this for for the world. Um, we have a few additional questions, um, and potentially there's another another one on on the life cycle analysis. Uh, and I don't know whether that would be for for Theo or for, or for you, Elizabeth. So <clears throat> there's a question about our life cycle analysis for emissions specifically. And we've seen in the press recently some, some concerns about plug-in hybrids, where we have people saying, oh, plug-in hybrids are not that clean. Um, and I guess that depends on how much that plug-in hybrid driver drives on electric versus conventional engine, right? So maybe, Elizabeth, you can touch on that. Sure. So in, in our modeling assumptions for this as well, we assumed a 40% utility factor. So meaning that 40% of the miles or kilometers are driven on electric. Um, certainly what we see in terms of kind of how cars are rated with their utility factors, it's, it's higher, but there have been a number of studies also in the EU looking at what the real world utility factor is. Um, and so for private cars, uh, they can be higher than 40% that we assume. But what we see is that especially for company cars, uh, the real world utility factor seems to be much lower often. And so in, in countries where company cars play a major role, like in Europe, um, 
the, the utility factor can vary a lot. But, but what we've used in our assumptions and what we've shown, uh, like the resulting LCA results that we've shown are, are based on a 40% utility factor. Obviously, if that goes increases, uh, we get much better results uh, in terms of the PHEV life cycle emissions. So time is running out, but we still want to address as many questions as possible. So we're just going to take a, a, a few more. Uh, one quickly from Thibault about the, the total cost of ownership and uh, do we have that by market uh, and for different countries? Very quickly, yes, we do. In the report, there's comparison for different markets, China, the US and Germany over time and with and without subsidy. And so that can actually be quite interesting to understand that policy works. Uh, policy support does help you break even earlier. But now we have just a, a, another question, I think, on batteries, right? And so um, it's one specifically on innovation and, and batteries. We talk about these different chemistries, right? LFP and so on, but what, what's next? Can we, can we yeah. be confident that, for example, sodium ion or other ones are, are promising? And then there's another one on recycling, uh, you know, wondering whether recycling is enough. Can we just you know, use recycling and then we don't need new critical minerals? Yeah. Okay, so for the first, uh, yes, there are innovations on the battery chemistry. That's not only the only type of innovation. Innovation manufacturing is also very important and decreased cost. The two most important chemistry we are looking at are sodium ion and solid state, very different application and challenges. Sodium ion, we do see some application and manufacturing at scale already this decade. We assume we have about 5% of sodium ion in 2030. That means lithium ion are still the biggest share, but 5% of the big demand of 2030 is out of batteries, but that depends quite significantly on the lithium price. So competitiveness of sodium ion depends strongly on the cost of lithium. And on solid state, uh, we see this as a, an important enable for application like heavy duty trucks, but there are still significant uncertainties on the scale up and the integration of those technologies, like the application of much higher stack pressure that need to be demonstrated at scale. And then we see this more for the 2030s as a function of how the industry has scale up more. While for recycling, moving then to the, to the second, recycling is absolutely essential. But we also have to keep in mind that that has a time lag compared to production. So the time in which we, we start to ramp up production, but we don't have much end of life batteries. So this take it, recycling will not play a big role in decreasing critical mineral demand. This will, over, will increase in 2030, reach significantly higher share, and in 2040. So we can expect recycling to cover all or most of our critical mineral demand later this century, so in the 2040s, 2050s. Uh, but before that would be critical, but not enough. We still need to mine and refine critical minerals as a function of the chemistry evolution. Yeah, and I think addition, adding to that, the, the, where that, that battery recycling capacity is installed yeah, is very important because it has to be you know, located where the, the vehicle has uh, its life ending, as Elder was telling us. And the second hand market can change that quite significantly. So there are certain tendencies also on that side. Exactly. Um, we're now way over time, but we appreciate uh, those uh, of you who stayed. And, um, and again, uh, thank you to the whole team here for presenting and going through these questions. If we missed your question, please do feel free to send it uh, via email. Um, and again, I remind you that all of this you can find as well on the IEA website. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. And we wish you a great day and a great weekend.